Would you like to start us with a prayer? Okay. Um, let's, uh, uh, may I begin with uh, Hail Mary in Latin? Sure. Number of Ave Maria, gracia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tuit mulieribus, et benedictus fruntux ventris tu, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc is nostra. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, this is uh, an opportunity just for me to introduce the show. Um, my name is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson, and um, I think you're my 209th interview. So <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing this for a while. So um, the show is author to author, and uh, I am here tonight with Dr. Mario Ram Ramos Reyes. Is that how I say it? Yes, Ramos? Yes. yes Reyes. And he's talking about his interesting book, Philosophy for Mysterious Times. So how are you doing? Um, I'm you? doing, I'm doing excellent. That's great. That's great. So um, this sounds like uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting topic. You, um, you define it as mysterious times. And uh I guess you could interpret that in many ways, the way the world is going nowadays. So, Well, the, that title came up after the pandemic uh, hit 2020 yeah. around March or April. Mm -hmm. So I had, like many people, stay home, and I began... Uh, revising and checking all my papers that I have been writing for years and notes mm -hmm. and, and things of that nature and decided to write um, about my impression of the pandemic, the reaction of people and so, and connect with uh, uh, a few things that I have been writing for, for years, particularly mm -hmm. notes for my classes uh, about mainly uh, the topic of philosophy, what mm -hmm. philosophy is, uh, about ethics, about politics, about mm -hmm. religion. And mm -hmm. so this book is a collection of short essays around uh, 1,200 uh, words each. And so I try to write and condense in each essay about my impression day by day, lasted at least uh, a year and a half mm -hmm. of, uh, of that time. So the title came up naturally to me because to me it was uh, mysterious in the profound sense. Um, that was a dramatic uh, event, which we did not have complete picture of the meaning, but trusted mm -hmm. in God's providence, I tried to discern and give some account of what was happening. Mm -hmm. And what is also interesting, at least to me, is that there is a, the first chapter, um, there is a, it is a little bit um, a memoir of my beginning as a philosopher back in the late 70s mm -hmm. in my home country in Paraguay, mm -hmm. home country in the midst of South America. Mm -hmm. And so how I encounter that uh, wisdom that we call philosophy. Mm -hmm. So there are a few um, essays on that encounter, or uh, let's say more clearly, a set of encounter. At least I counted three events of my life that uh, changed my life forever. And I decided to to study philosophy, teaching philosophy, which was unique and was very strange for someone who was coming from a very poor country with no libraries, under a very, very harsh dictatorship, no mm -hmm. freedom. So that is beyond imagination to anyone in America. Mm -hmm. um, but I 
Um, I'm proud of saying that I read the classics then mm -hmm. um, in the uh, in the <clears throat> uh, domestic tradition. Mm -hmm. um, my formation, I think, was um, I could I would call quite good compared to even what we are or some people are receiving today in some universities. So okay. that's is in a nutshell my my book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really been um, it's really reflecting more than uh, a short period of time. It's going back to the to the beginning of this. Uh, what should we say? Love affair with philosophy. Right. Yeah. Because the yeah. Yeah. That's the way I often think of some of these disciplines, you know. I had no interest in theology when I was young. I wasn't even Christian. And um once I started reading theology, I mean it was like, wow. You know, the it, it just opens up whatever your discipline is, I mean, especially within the Catholic tradition, philosophy or theology. It just changes your life. It really is. It's like, you know, it's like, I don't know, like the first uh, sense of spring or something. You know, you feel alive and you you fall in love with it. And exactly. it lasts a whole lifetime. Yeah. So. It, yes. In, in, in my case, in the, this uh, first chapter, which is a memoir, Mm -hmm. I just described my first encounter in high school mm -hmm. to um, not a professor, by uh, rather I encountered a book. Uh -huh. And that book changed my life um, dramatically. The professor who was teaching in high school, I'm talking about early 70s, mm -hmm. in a small country, landlocked country, he was teaching philosophy. Mm -hmm. And that book was, uh, still is in, at least in print, uh, was written by, or yeah, it was written by one of the most um, well-known personalists of Spain at mm -hmm. that time, and still is, I think, is Julian Marias. Mm -hmm. And his book, History of Philosophy, was uh, very well written. Mm -hmm. It's a collection of notes that he took from classes when he was uh, studying at the University of Madrid in the 30s. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and it, this book has a lot, uh, at, at least 50 editions. So by, wow. th by that time, I just um, read that book and the professor whom I'm referring recommended that book and it changed my life because it showed that um, basically it's more important. Philosophy is just not um, a speculative endeavor, rather was an experience of life. That is in the first chapter of that book, mm -hmm. which, is con uh, um, which is in accord to what uh, the, the teacher of uh, Julian Maria's uh, taught, Ortega y Gasset, which philosophy is, um, is a vital experience. It's something that mm -hmm. Your life is uh, intimately, intimately connected to. It's mm -hmm. not just something intellectual. It's not a German idealism. Right. It's an mm -hmm. experience. And so mm -hmm. that changed, even though, and I noticed in my essay that that mm -hmm. teacher, uh, who was a very good politician then, he's a courageous man. He already passed away. He was mm -hmm. a Kantian, very mm -hmm. formal, very mm -hmm. strict. So his teaching was not in accord to what the book that he was recommending was very strange. Mm -hmm. So as a faithful Kantian, he was not someone who you feel passion or feel attracted. At least that was not my experience. It was very formal, very mm -hmm. accurate, but he took distance from what is called our sense, um, our, yes, human passion. So, mm -hmm. however, that um, class and that book put me into direction um, going to um, um, a, to the college. I went to the Catholic University then, and I began st uh, studying law. 
I went to mm -hmm. law school. Mm -hmm. And that's very common. Uh, it was very common then for many Latin Americans who the only choice that you had was either go to medicine, engineering, or mm -hmm. law. There was mm -hmm. no other yeah. way of making it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and so law was a way to learn about the legal structure, political structure, and then you can read some philosophy along the way. Mm -hmm. But um, in, I think in the second year of law school, I took uh, an elective mm -hmm. uh, class uh, and the title was philosophy. Mm -hmm. I, the reason what I took, because I was already under the influence of that first encounter, but I didn't expect much more than what I uh, found in high school. And yet I was surprised by the caliber of the teacher who just show up in class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, coming from um, Louvain. Uh, mm. That professor just presented his uh, the, the dissertation. He was a, a PhD um, in philosophy. And mm -hmm. his, first, his class was about the symposium, uh, Plato's symposium. And he started um, engaging in a dialogue with everyone. And he make the class coming alive. Even mm. though the students who were there were student who are expecting someone to repeat, I don't know, the a code or some statue, but mm -hmm. he, this teacher was extraordinary, gifted, and, and the closeness to the students and, and, and the care that he portrayed and you felt, mm -hmm. that transformed my, my view of philosophy. And I say, well, there are people who are living what I encountered in that book. And so, mm -hmm. and this uh, professor later became one of the greatest intellectual, public intellectual in my home country. He already passed away in 2000, um, almost 2000, the year 2000. Um, he was a phenomenologist to some sort. Mm -hmm. However, his background was uh, quite Thomistic. And so, but he was basically phenomenology. He was coming from uh, Louvain, uh, where Professor Lupin and all that were his teachers. And so, mm -hmm. and, and that, um, and I decided then to begin studying philosophy. Mm -hmm. So I didn't quit law rather than enroll in some courses um, following the curriculum of the School of Philosophy. So I studied both. Um, that was, uh, I was very young and I had the, the strength to do that. I went to mm -hmm. law school in the afternoon and then in the evening I went to uh, take classes in uh, school of philosophy. Mm -hmm. and so with time, um, I think the third year of school of philosophy, that professor himself said that there was another teacher coming from Argentina. Mm -hmm. um, he was about to teach metaphysics. We didn't mm -hmm. have that subject matter. Uh -huh. and the reason why we didn't have is because we didn't have enough. We have three, three teachers and mm -hmm. we were five, ten students. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a dictatorship. We are talking about a very small country where people were not supposed to be studying philosophy. You're not going to earn any money, zero, if mm -hmm. you want to. <laughs> to mm -hmm. feed your family doing philosophy. So we right. were there romantic uh, kids who wanted to know something. That is why I never quit law because law was my, my I don't know, my backup in order to survive mm -hmm. uh, sure. financially. And so mm -hmm. and he said, this um, professor who is coming back, he was a Paraguayan, mm -hmm. he's coming back and he's going to give you or all the students a uh, course in metaphysics. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, great. And he said, my, my professor said, don't miss his class. Okay. Mm -hmm. I narrated everything in my book. And so I went to his class, the first class. 
Mm -hmm. I never, I will never forget the first class. Mm -hmm. uh, the book that he used was uh, the Jack Murray 10, 7 Lessons on Being. Mm -hmm. and, and he started explaining his very detailed, very calm voice, um, every single step and the uh, uh, type of being and all that. So was to me was a... a, 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 a I open in so to speak mm -hmm. the sense of awe, and so after the class, I tried to uh, talk to him. He was very, very um, in a hurry because he had to go to his house, to his home, who was far away from the the university. Is far away, it's two hours or so, and it was already nine o'clock in the evening. So he said, "Well, I don't have the time now. I have to take the bus and." But why don't you go to my home? I'm going to wait for you next Sunday, the next Saturday or the following sa Saturday. And I said, okay, sure. I'm going to go and visit you because I want to talk to you about what you just said in class. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I decided to go one Saturday and I drove my little car. I own a Volkswagen. They are no longer in. <laughs> Manufacture is a small car, very cheap. Mm -hmm. And I drove there uh, about an hour and a half and very small town. Today, if you go there, it's completely different. Today, it's just mm -hmm. a big city. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a small uh, uh, town and, and I was looking for his home and I asked, People, we didn't have phone then. We didn't have mm -hmm. any G <laughs> GPS or anything of that sort. And so I just have in a piece of paper the address. And so I start asking. And then one kid uh, with uh, barefoot, I mean, poor kids, he said, oh, I know. I know Mr. Nunez. I know him. And uh, do you know where he lived? Yes, he lived over there. He just pointed out a couple of blocks up. North, and he said, and he's selling water. And I said, what? Well, in Spanish, it's called aguatero. Someone who is making money out of selling water. Mm -hmm. Okay, he has a, 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 a little bit of um, uh, land. And so people who were not able to have uh, water in their home, he just selling for a, a few cents. Mm -hmm. And so he was there um, under a tree, a little tank of water, and people with their little um, uh, little things that brought to him, and he just filled with the water. And so, and at the end, and they pay a, a few cents. So I go there, and that was a surprise. Right there, you have someone with a PhD in theology, mm -hmm. a PhD in philosophy, mm -hmm. selling water in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh my God, that's my future. Mm -hmm. And so, and he was uh, reading, waiting for his client, reading mm -hmm. some books, uh, highlighted, and I still remember. And he said, well, sit down and let's talk about when I finish my selling these, uh, these people. And we talk for two, three hours. And that is what, uh, and he was, I am, uh, I am fine in him, my true, what I call um, guidance, my, my mentor. Mm -hmm. He was, he was a promised. Um, mm -hmm. He, he, he was in, he was at that point, and that's very interesting. At that point, uh, he was a former priest. Mm -hmm. But hold on. He was one of the first who, after 72, 73, with the crisis, uh, after the council, mm -hmm. who at one point wrote a famous letter. I didn't know that then, where he asked permission to Paul the Six, 
And he explained why. It's a public record. I have a, a copy. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> the Pope, after see, two years, uh, allowed him to give him the permission and so on. He married at, after that, went to Argentina, and then he was coming back when I met him. Now, he had, before I met him, a long career, member of the Catholic Action, mm -hmm. great preacher, solid theologian. Qualities that he kept until he died at the age of 92, 93, mm -hmm. in 2010, 2012. Mm -hmm. Never once, never once, he doubted about anything of the magisterium. Ever. Mm -hmm. In other words, he was more orthodox than many priests who continue being priests. Mm -hmm. I can sure. And I have, and I have document about that. So he was really a Um, and I can go on and on. So he was my, my mentor. Uh, he, the director of my, my, uh, thesis as a, I, I got a licentia mm -hmm. after six years studied philosophy. Uh, I got a the licentia, it's called licentia. And so mm -hmm. he guided me and he was the director of my work. I, I think I wrote on freedom. And so, and introduced me to Jacques Maritain and Etienne Gilson and the classics and Gary Goulag mm -hmm. and all that. And so, but, um, and finally, to make a, a conclusion on this short uh, account of my life. After that, I encounter just uh, being a very young teacher at the Catholic University in the late, late 80s. Um, I was just doing philosophy and uh, teaching high school, two high school, uh, sometimes three in order to mm -hmm. make end meet. And, so one day I encounter a priest mm -hmm. who looked for me. I never looked for him. I never knew who he was. Mm -hmm. And he's still alive. He's the only one who's still alive. An Italian priest who was, uh, was on a mission in my home country. And he said, um, well, I know you. And I said, no, you don't. We never met. No, I know you because I know some of your students. And they have spoke to me about you. Ah, okay, Father. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want to uh, meet you. Do you have time now? And I said, well, I know I, I'm teaching right now, but I'm leaving. I finish at 9.30. And he said, I'm going to wait for you. And so he waited for me, and we went to eat dinner. Um. So for me was a complete change of my life in the sense that my philosophy at this point was quite speculative, even though it was very orthodox and very clear. Mm -hmm. He said, well, life is more than that. Christian life is an experience. And so he introduced me a view of um, life as incarnated. Um, so he was one of the first missionaries of the, what we call today, movement, ecclesial movement, then was very new, or relatively new, in South America was new, uh, which is communion and liberation. Mm -hmm. So the liberation was the sense of communion, the sense of communion. Mm -hmm. And so... Without saying much, without preaching, without, um, eh, without telling me what to do, he just offered uh, his friendship. That's the word mm -hmm. friendship. We mm -hmm. are friends and we are going into the same pilgrimage toward our own destiny. Mm -hmm. And so that view changed completely my, my view of, uh, even the Christian life, because I had some view which were what we call very moralistic. Many things we ought to do instead of focusing on 
how we together in the sense of communion can trust one another in this love after the encounter mm -hmm. will slowly move to our true liberation. So, <clears throat> and then I incorporated slowly all my philosophical background into that experience. And I never um, changed since then, ever. Uh, I may have had some uh, crisis, if you will, uh, coming into the U.S., studying in a public university where no one and zero understood even my language. I'm not talking about it uh, because I spoke in Spanish. Uh, they didn't understand the language of a philosophy, um, Thomistic tradition yeah. or Christian tradition. They didn't know mm -hmm. what um, the, uh, when I, I remember writing the human person, I use the human person and one professor said to me, no, you don't have to use person. Human is human. And I said, no, because he's a divine person as well. Well, that's a, your assumption. You need to just to write human. And that was a, <laughs> that was a full professor. And yeah. how in the world I have to, uh, I, 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 I should survive, you will hear. And so that was my, journey and was very difficult but what kept me um um alive in my faith was my 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 background my, my encounter even <clears throat> though i chose to write my dissertation on jack martin and, and my committee were people none of them were was catholic <clears throat> and i did it um, <clears throat> and 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 we discuss and and I did all my research, and and so at the end, many of them were very um, sympathetic and impressed. And, and I'm talking about the '90s uh, mm -hmm. to the until the year 2000. The year 2000, probably uh, I was already a doctor, but um, things changed after the September 11 and all that. So things got even worse, I, I, I think, in that sense. But um, what is my point? My point is that when uh, anyone have meaningful encounter when they are young, that has a lasting um, legacy. I think I will never forget that. Always when I doubt something, I try to go back to what... Um, these um, uh, these uh, professors or pre have told me and kept me alive, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> alive in the in the spiritual sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. So that's quite a story. You know, so many have uh, many people have an encounter but you seem to have had quite a few, you know, and they seem to have all had a uh, tremendous effect on you. You're lucky. Or well, perhaps what I say uh, very often is I have just one encounter, mm -hmm. uh, but the mystery encountered me three or four times. Yeah. Okay. Explicitly. Mm -hmm. I, I may have an other, but I was probably distracted, didn't pay attention. Mm -hmm. But um, I still remember vividly every single instance when I have those encounters. This, I mm -hmm. wrote about it. Now, any other impression that I may have after that, I just forgot. But those mm -hmm. were... Uh, it's, it's, it's life changing. It's intelligible rationally. It's something that is happening. And you don't know why, but it's giving mm -hmm. you a sense of joy. Um, you know what this joy is coming from. And mm -hmm. so, and that's, it's illuminated in many ways. Now, mm -hmm. that is, <laughs> I can tell you uh, another story. I, I always wanted to study theology. I never studied theology mm -hmm. up to that point. Mm -hmm. But I always wanted to be curious about theology. And I, mm -hmm. I always said to myself, I'm not a really Catholic because I don't know how to 
uh, excuse me, I'm really Catholic because I don't know how to quote the scripture. <laughs> My evangelical friends uh, know everything about the scripture, ups and down, back and forth. I didn't know that. I'm a Catholic. But I said, always, someday I will study theology. Someday, mm -hmm. when I get older. But I never had opportunity. Why? Because I was already teaching. Uh, I was married. And so what am I going to do? Just study for myself. Yes, I continue reading here and there, but not systematically. And yet, after many years, in the late uh, year 2000, 2008 or 10, I remember right now, there was um, um, an offer given by Ave Maria University. Mm -hmm. They were about to open, um, let's call a branch, not a branch, but um, uh, yes, a little branch for a while in the diocese where I'm located. Mm -hmm. And so, and they will, they establish a master program in theology. So the teachers would be flying from Naples, Florida. Mm -hmm. Every two months, and we would have classes the whole weekend, beginning, I think Friday, uh, Friday up to Sunday evening, mm -hmm. so that we can complete the number of hours required by, um, by the the the, the, the call the school, mm -hmm. and so um, it was very intense at twenty twenty seven credit and it's a theology. And so I decided to, to apply, and, and I began studying theology late in life. That was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, two years that lasted the program were very, very, to me, were very meaningful, sure. even though I never had that type of encounter that I had before, but many questions that I had um, lingering uh, were answered because we have a very good professor in, in um, moral theology and sacred scriptures and mm -hmm. canon law. And so I got, uh, after two years, my master in theology. Mm -hmm. Even though I always say very carefully, I'm not a theologian. I don't have the the skills for being a theologian. I'm a philosopher. I'm mm -hmm. no. I, I can know things about theology, but I mm -hmm. don't don't have the ear for a theologian. I respect mm -hmm. them profoundly, and I know what they are debating. But uh, when I debate, I don't want to engage in those things. I prefer philosophical thing and use argument and all that because that's my I think is my nature. Mm. Well we all have different callings and clearly yours is to philosophy. Yeah. That's and it seems to have served you very well. It's it's clear to me the way you talk if you could see how your face lights up when you talk about philosophy and you talk about those encounters. I mean, you can see how much they still, you know, it's still, it, you're more full of life than you were a few seconds before you start talking about them. So that's, that's really, you know, that, that's really wonderful. So many people think that they love something and, you know, 10 years down the road, they say, well, I think I'll go study something else. You know, you, you, those encounters really had an impact, permanent impact. And it is apparent when you talk about them. Yes, and, and, and particularly when I was doing my dissertation mm -hmm. at the University of Kansas, I have very good advisor because, but they they were not uh, um, they were not Catholic, but they were very good, very respectful, mm -hmm. very erudite. Some of them. Mm -hmm. um, so many times I said, well, I don't know how I'm going to write this or explain this. 
And then one day he said, well, I need a, someone to ask about these things. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the 90s. And so mm -hmm. I, I'm going to, and I look at, um, well, I was doing my research at the library and I found, well, there are some Tommies around the country. And I wrote a letter to, I was reading uh, Ralph McInerney mm -hmm. book on Pippin Thomist. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm going to write this professor. He lives in uh, Indiana. In, mm -hmm. in, and so I wrote a letter. I mean, those years, you write a letter. Well, you don't have emails. You don't have. That's true. And so I wrote a short letter. And, and well, he received it. And he called me by phone mm -hmm. to my home. Mm -hmm. um, to my apartment and I was not there he left a message we have answering mm -hmm. machines then yeah. and so I called him back mm -hmm. and what was my question I, I said well professor I need uh, I'm doing x y or z and I, I, uh, I know that you are there at the Jack Maritain um, archives and all that and he said yes yes um, and I said um out of my desperation, I said, do you think that I should move into Notre Dame? And he said, no, don't do that. Because we are going to, the, <laughs> we are going through the same crisis. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, he said, and don't worry about, it. I'm going to accompany you. I'm going to support you. Mm -hmm. If you have any question, I will send you material, resources, and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was it. And I think it was very helpful um, because um, moving was a little crazy. I mean, it's not um, like today. It's, it's, it's another world. And so that, I think, uh, these resources I got from my background and Mm -hmm. What we need sometimes and scholars and many other people who are not scholars is people whom they can get together, trust and be friends so that mm -hmm. the world is not, um, um, it's not destroying them, if you will. Because some mm -hmm. very often, sometimes uh, the culture is in such a disarray that we lose hope. And so, and we need to be aware that we are here together, even though we may be um, uh, um, far away from one another. Now, today mm -hmm. it's easier because we have Zoom and mm -hmm. many other way of contact. We can form group in WhatsApp about uh, about uh, our concern and our our vocation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you think of the difference between even 20 years ago and today, you know, the access that we have to other people through technology is truly amazing. You know, yes, it, um, yeah, I mean, even something, even if it's not even just between uh, individuals, I mean, who would ever think that people could get good Catholic education by sitting in front of a computer? you know, and interacting with people. It's truly, it's a, it's a one, the, the whole, I don't know what we would call it, just this whole revolution, the computer revolution, the digital revolution has really had, it's had some horrible effects, but it can also be used for tremendous good. You know, I interview people all the time, twice a week, and I have met Catholics that are so strong and that have such insights that they're able to share with me and through me to other people. It's, it's amazing to me that, that this has happened in my lifetime. You know, like you, I came from the time when you, you went to the library and you, if you were lucky, they had a Xerox machine and you could copy something. You know? <laughs> no more do we have to go through that. <laughs> But uh, so it is, it is exactly. something wonderful. Yes. You know, some, you know, so many people see it as, as an evil and certainly it can be used for evil, but it also has a wonderful side. Right. 
Yeah. It's a means. Yeah. The, it's oh, a, yeah. It's a mean, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful tool. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, truly amazing. Gee, I remember when the technology was, you know, to get like an adding machine. And then one at one point we got these little calculators. It was like that was that was something. And now here we talk to people on the other side of the world in real time uh, about important things. It's it's amazing. Yes, yes. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. and also for um sharing information mm -hmm. with exchange of views. Mm -hmm. Um that is very helpful. Right now one of my projects, hopefully I can finish by next year, is um, is um, how can I call the genre? It's a memoir, mm -hmm. more or less. It's history, but it's also political philosophy, mm -hmm. which is which is the account of the rise, the and the decline. Of Christian democracy in Latin America. Mm, mm -hmm. So how the whole movement came about, what are the figures, the relevant uh, intellectuals and politicians, and mm -hmm. why is the reason, some reason, they decline. And so the, the, the figure which is central in this development, at least in my account, is Maritain. Mm -hmm. And how his influence in the 1920s and 30s when he traveled there and began forming small groups um, reached to its peak in the 60s with mm -hmm. a couple of presidents uh, in Venezuela, in Chile, who mm -hmm. were Maritan disciples. And they claim, and not only they claim, Maritan claimed they were. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then the decline for mainly the crisis of the council on the one hand, but I do believe it's more the influence of liberation theology, mm -hmm. which um, penetrated many um, group of Christian Democrats, and then at the end, everything fell apart and disappeared. Mm -hmm. Today, mm -hmm. today it's not only unintelligible for young people talk about Christian democracy. They not even know that I even are aware that such a claim, such a movement existed mm -hmm. because the force, if you will, of secularism is such that no one in politics want to call himself Christian. It's mm -hmm. just uh, synonymous as uh, hater or something, mm -hmm. tol yeah. someone intolerant and so on. So, yeah. but the movement was powerful um, mm -hmm. and influential. Now, I'm not saying that was the best utopian way of dealing with politics, which it wasn't. Now, none of them claimed that they had the solution rather than there was a way of understanding the Catholic tradition within the framework of civil liberties and it's a mm -hmm. very Maritanian view like Rose Dauhat wrote a piece in New York Times three, four months ago he said gentle Catholicism is more genteel so now that was the idea of Christian democracy in Latin America and Europe was a little bit different but not, not quite and so so I'm working on that, and, mm -hmm. and in order, my, my goal is just to let people know, the new generation, that that view existed mm -hmm. and, and was doable and was mm -hmm. um, uh, reasonable, and it was not a bunch of fundamentalists far away from that. And they were very orthodox in their faith. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about here a progressivism. Um, no, they were very, very common, sensical people. 
um, and which was an alternative to other view were very extreme coming from the left and coming from the right. Mm -hmm. and so and I'm working in, um, hopefully I will finish next year. Mm -hmm. and, and in order to write that, I'm getting contact with people in all over, all over the world. I'm just uh, this morning was talking to someone in Argentina who knew also he has some sources and he said, yeah, and we were discussing. So these ideas of this way of exchange was completely, <laughs> was impossible in the 90s. Um, mm -hmm. Because uh, unless you travel to those places and do some research, now we have very easy access. The only thing we need to do is to, um, get to know these people, ask questions, and we can get um, mm -hmm. chat uh, with Zoom and, and, and work uh, in this uh, work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, you know, when you think of it, that's very significant. You know, it's, it seems common sense when you say it, but so many people would never think of approaching that way. You know, so. In, 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 in what sense? Well, you know, it makes sense to try to, uh, to understand things that have happened in the past in terms of what was going on in the past, not in our interpretation of it from our life now. And I think that that's, that's often a problem. Because people actually don't know much history. I don't know why that is. You know, everyone has to take history classes. But I don't think that people necessarily, they tend to interpret what has been thought or done in the past through the eyes of the present, instead of trying to understand it from the eyes of the past. And that's when you're talking about the type of people that you're talking to and that you have talked to, they don't seem to suffer from that uh, mistake you know so that's that's really important you know and i mean it's it's very you know it's very easy for people to make that mistake because we always think that we're progressing sometimes we're not we may be moving forward but actually backwards you know and um so we think we're progressing and so when we think about something that occurred in the past we think well like you know well that was wrong look at what we know now and it's not right. So that historical perspective, um, I think, is not valued by very many people today. And I, and I see that in you. You value that. And you're talking to people that understand that the same way as you do. So you can, you can actually, I think you can come up with material that others would look at and not understand. But you can really understand it. That's that's good. <laughs> I wish I could do that, <laughs> but um, hmm. yeah, it's it's very good. The but, what you're saying, <laughs> um, I learned, and that I learned in the early eighties, mm -hmm. that um, perhaps that come from the Spanish tradition, particularly mm -hmm. personalist tradition. Mm -hmm. um, Ortega y Gasser was not a personalist, but yet many of his disciples were. It's very interesting. And he, he was an agnostic, and yet one of the greatest Catholic philosophers in Spain were his disciples. Yeah. Um, because he respected what he was his motto. Mm -hmm. I am who I am in my circumstances. That was his motto. Mm -hmm. And so many disciples had different circumstances. Mm -hmm. And they have different experience regarding the regarding the mystery of God. And he said, okay, you go from, you are who you are according to your circumstances. And though they build this view based on what he called historicity of human enterprise. Mm -hmm. We are historical beings. We are mm -hmm. not an attraction. And mm -hmm. so if we forget history, we forget who we are. Yeah. And with... Yeah. As you said, 
we just make things, um, make up things about history. We just project mm -hmm. our ideological lenses mm -hmm. into the past rather than understanding and do a very accurate hermeneutic about the past. Mm -hmm. And so that is why today we are going through this, I, I call craziness of mm -hmm. destroying statues um, yeah. that remember us about the past as we could erase the past. The past is what it is. Mm -hmm. It may have some problems, of course. We are not perfect. Ha mm -hmm. Have some glories, of course. But mm -hmm. the past is what it is. We cannot yeah. uh, change the past. It's change mm -hmm. who we are. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is a lack of understanding. And that is getting even, I think, more uh, the, the mistake that we are making as a culture and society is graver mm -hmm. because we when we ignore history we don't know where to go we make things up mm -hmm. and we believe that we have all the solution through technology mm -hmm. and instead of looking at the past we trust in algorithm mm -hmm. and so that's that's insane yeah. that's irrational it is. it is but it's also getting more prevalent i think um, but as I say, you know, I'm not exactly sure why this is happening. I know in this country, everyone has to study history, even to get a high school diploma. You know, you have to study history in Western civilization and sometimes Eastern civilization in college. And yet it's like, I don't know how, I don't know how the disjoint occurs, but there's a tremendous disjoint, you know, because it's, everything is interpreted from now and now isn't what was happening then <laughs> so exactly yeah yeah so that's you know that i think is it's a gift uh to you that you have that uh a gift of you uh that you have that sensibility and it's certainly something that will i think have um positive effects on the people who are taught by you or who read your work. Yeah. Yes, that's my, I don't know if my vocation, my calling, mm -hmm. um, because <laughs> my, I always say that uh, for me, philosophy is not a written enterprise, it's an oral enterprise. Mm -hmm. Um. In that sense, I'm coming from more the Mediterranean tradition, more mm -hmm. continental, if you will, less written tradition. Mm -hmm. So philosophy you do in your classroom, in the public mm -hmm. square, through newspaper columns, uh, much more than through research articles or papers. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a tradition. Now, people, of course, people in academic circle would say that's not philosophy. I disagree with that. Mm -hmm. I think it's the opposite. I think you need to engage with people who mm -hmm. are out there and who may not have the language you have, but they have the intuition. They have the same problems. Mm -hmm. They have to come from the same drama that you are. And that's philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, there is a famous article that I have in my in my desk in front of my desk which is called let me it's uh, written by Julian Marias it's called Periodismo y Filosofía mm -hmm. it's journalism and philosophy it's a 100 uh, excuse me 1000 word article mm -hmm. um, where he made the case that the greatest of all philosophers always wrote in pieces. And mm -hmm. in the 20th century, he said many of them, particularly in the Spanish tradition or the Latin tradition, they wrote very thoughtful um, a, a newspaper column. Mm -hmm. And so for today, those columns, of course, were the common, even common... <laughs> <laughs> professor of philosophy, they don't understand very well, but very well written, 
mm-hmm. very well throughout, uh, very well established, because you need to convey people who may not be an expert in philosophy about different issues. Um, in his case, Maria's wrote hundreds of thousands of them. Oh. Um, and many of his book is just a collection of them uh, mm-hmm. that he organized in, uh, in sequence. And so it's very, very important. In other words, that's an oral type of philosophy. Mm-hmm. You know, the orality, they engage with the public square. Mm-hmm. In the U.S., perhaps... Uh, the tradition of Mortimer Adler or people like that. Mm-hmm. So, but um, I think that is important. And and when you teach, that is very important because students don't want to hear you talk about your papers, which are unintelligible for them. They want to talk about their own dramas, their own issues, mm-hmm. their un- anxieties and questions. Mm-hmm. And so... And that is, um, I think, philosophy all about. Mm-hmm. Well, I tend to agree with you. <laughs> so. Oh, so you have some, you have some very important insights. Yes. You know, if, yeah, and uh, passing, you know, when you pass anything like that on to your students. You're also helping them to learn how to think. You know, that's really important. You know, there's a lot of very educated people. I don't know if it's just in this country or if it's everywhere, but there are very many highly educated people in this country that I often wonder if they can think. You know, they they know their discipline and they work within it, but it's like a box, you know. And... uh, that's something that we need to avoid. You know, obviously you have to know your discipline. I'm not saying not, but um, but it's you have to be able to relate to other things, and so often they can't. You know? I always r- remind my student that um, when I teach, uh, teach uh, ethics or moral philosophy, I say, well, the question is not how people live. Mm-hmm. The question is how people ought to live. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we need to find uh, the norms and the principles mm-hmm. of a good life. It's not just uh, an account of uh, how people live in such and such uh, group or tribe or whatever. It's the same thing. I say, well, the question is that people don't think; everyone think. But the question is how we ought to think, and then mm-hmm. we need to know the basic of logic. Mm-hmm. Um, what is a premise? Uh, what is a conclusion? What is a <laughs> mm-hmm. minor term? And, and the basic uh, Aristotelian logic. And that's mm-hmm. completely absent from, I'm sorry to say, many um, speeches of uh, politicians and, and mm-hmm. sometimes papers. They d- ignore what uh, the basic of logic is. And, and, and that... Uh, speak not well about our education no it doesn't mm-hmm. yeah you're right i agree you know i think if you apart from issues of um you know social class and uh, in this country even though we uh, all pretend we're equal i mean you know not, obviously we are equal as humans but we pretend that all are valued equally, which is, to me, not the truth. Um, you know, I just, I think of people having native intellect, you know, they're, they've got the ability to learn, but they're never given the opportunity uh, to learn. You know, I mean, I've, I've taught in college uh, prior to Holy Apostles, and I mean, you'll have someone who's studying for a bachelor's degree, and they can they can barely read. And it's like, how did how did they, how did you get out of high school? <laughs> you right. know. But it's like when I look apart from uh, social class issues in this country, which I think are still very strong, and ethnic uh, issues in this country. It's um, I just think of the amount of. 
I don't know if I should use the word waste, but it's like people who could understand and know things at a deeper level that the meaningful things, you know, and they never will because they're not being given the opportunity. And a great deal of that, I think, is because of, um, you know, the, the way philosophy is taught. I and mean, when you look at even, uh, you know, if you have a, maybe a high school course in Intro to Philosophy, it's really only learning names and what people thought. It's not learning how to think. And so our whole, our whole country, this country, you know, and I mean, I don't know what other countries, but I'm assuming most because this seems to be the the move that we, the movement we're currently undergoing. You know, um, it's it's a, a sad thing for the cultures, but it's a terrible thing for the people. You know, I mean, can you imagine going through your whole life not really being able to think? I mean, you obviously thoughts go through your mind, but you can't have any organized or anything logical. It's a human tragedy. But, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. In <laughs> um, one student a couple of weeks ago said, okay, but we cannot know we cannot have, he said, philosophical outlook like you have. And I said, what? What is my philosophical outlook? <laughs> I don't know. Do I have a scientific outlook? Mm -hmm. The only outlook that I have mm -hmm. is that I get to know things through my senses. And you do know through your senses as well. We are in the same boat. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, how do you know that mm -hmm. I'm here? Because I'm looking at you. Okay, see? <laughs> and so I start going through basic 101 Aristotle, Aristotelian music. Well, common sense. But this is not my philosophical outlook. It's human way of knowing things. Mm -hmm. I don't have innate ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and why? Well, have you found a baby saying what motherhood is? No. See? He's going to learn later. Mm -hmm. And so, but that, I don't know where this kid get this idea. The way well, on the philosophic outlook, the, 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 the way of thinking, those, um, ideological, I don't know, um, mm. talking points, which prevent them from thinking, not only rationally, have a common sense thinking. We know other our senses and we move from there. And, and that is what Aquinas did. And Aristotle said the sense of sight is perhaps better than others. And But it's common sense. For them, that is a revelation. It's uh, something that for them is just, wow, and it's common sense. My point is that the talking point of the media, the culture is in uh -huh. such a disarray that yeah. are not educated, are confusing things. And it's very simple sometimes. At mm -hmm. least it's simple how to start thinking seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I don't know how we get from where we are um, to where Sorry. we should be. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I mean, really, it's true. I, I don't know how we will uh, or how we can. And uh, as I said, I imagine much of the world is in the same uh, kettle of fish, so to speak. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, so it's kind of... Um, kind of depressing <laughs> you know, it's like think of it as as knowing the answer but no one's willing to listen <laughs> you know it's like we have the answer no no you don't so um i don't know it's uh it's interesting when you 
when you think about the state of the world, you know, because it is in such disarray. I don't know. <laughs> there is an anecdote. I don't know if that is a true anecdote, but it's still an anecdote. Uh, Winston Churchill, after the war, I think mm -hmm. 1948, or uh, he was no longer prime minister, and he came to the U.S., went to mm -hmm. Massachusetts, to the um, MIT, mm -hmm. and people were explaining to him the advances in technology and all that, those things mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. These uh, the research we were doing, and, and one of the presenters said, "Here you have a technology that, in the future, could prevent uh, another Hitler to rise again, and you don't, you will not need more about um, politics because we are going to control everything. Technology is going to solve uh, those issues, mm -hmm. and so." And so uh, Churchill just listened carefully and he said nothing. And at the end, he said, well, Mr. Churchill, what do you say about that? And he said, well, the only thing that I want to say about that is I would like to be dead by then. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I never heard that before, but that's a good answer, isn't it? <laughs> that's uh, a... <laughs> That's yeah. that's very good. Yeah, I like it. Well, Winston Churchill, he was really something. Right. Know, they don't make them like him anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So but that's that is great. I hope to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> oh well. Well. Okay. This has been a very uh, very interesting interview for me. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah you're uh, you're quite the thinker. You know, <laughs> you you might be able to be one of the people that's actually able to have. Uh, I think you can actually have a big influence. I hope so. Well, I'm trying. <laughs> yes, well, but you just keep trying. <laughs> yeah, and God will okay. help. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, would you like to close us in prayer? Um, can I pray in Spanish? Of course. Um, en nombre del Padre, del Hijo, del Espíritu Santo. Amén. Dios te salve, María, llena eres de gracia, el Señor es contigo. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. Santa María, Madre de Dios, ruega por nosotros pecadores, ahora y en la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Thank you. Thank you very much. For yes, this time. Thank you. I yeah, really enjoyed it. I had a great I did too. I had a great time. And I learned a lot too. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so uh, if you ever want another interview, just let me know and we'll do it again. <laughs> okay, I will. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you take care. <laughs>